So there's a wide variety of different oncological emergencies that can have an impact in critical care. Hypercalcemia is one of the more important ones that you need to be aware of. This can affect almost 25% of all patients who have some form of malignancy at some point in time during their disease. Often when they first present to hospital, unbeknownst to them that they have a malignancy, presenting strictly with signs and symptoms of hypercalcemia. Now hypercalcemia itself is a uh, I would assume something that you should be familiar with, both in terms of its signs and symptoms and presentation, uh, so that you recognize it uh, when it occurs. You need to know that calcium levels are controlled by a variety of different uh, systems that interplay within each other, including the bowel, the bone, the kidneys, and the parathyroids. All of these influence the level of calcium in the blood. Now the primary uh, hormone that's responsible for calcium release and increasing calcium in the blood is PTH. PTH increases reabsorption of, uh, of bone mineral to release calcium into the, uh, into the blood and also it, has, uh, it also provides uh, feedback to the kidneys to increase reabsorption of calcium uh, in the distal tubules. PTH also is responsible for phosphate excretion at the kidney level and also assists in converting calcitriol to vitamin, active vitamin D. Now vitamin D, as you know, increases primarily bowel absorption of calcium uh, to increase calcium levels in the blood. There are a wide variety of different causes for uh, hypercalcemia, but in malignancy the most they're most often caused by um, a PTH-related hormone, uh, PTHRP, which occurs in about 70% of all cases. Uh, there's usually this uh, paraneoplastic syndrome that's, uh, that's causing the, the hypercalcemia. Like more, more unusually, you can get osteolysis from uh, meta met uh, metastatic disease, so bone, mineral, bone destruction directly by the, uh, by the uh, malignancy inside the bone can cause the release of calcium. Um, and then occasionally you can see the, uh, uh, um, some forms of lymphoma that can produce a parathyroid, or uh, sorry, a, a calcitriol um, analog, which has a similar uh, perineoplastic effect. And then only very rarely will you see the, the, uh, uh, an ectopic PTH uh, secreting tumor as the cause of uh, increased uh, um, calcium levels in the blood. So making the diagnosis of hypercalcemia is probably one of the more straightforward uh, diagnostic dilemmas in critical care. You just simply have to measure a calcium level. Now some sites will, have, uh, uh, will not have access to an ionized calcium. That's becoming increasingly uh, unusual in, even in areas where we have uh, point of care testing. Um, but occasionally you will, and in the case where you don't have access to an ionized calcium, which is a much more accurate way of, of, uh, of uh, identifying hypercalcemia, you then need to have an albumin level associated with it and then uh, perform a correction on the albumin and calcium levels to find the true calcium level. Cal hypercalcemia presents with a fairly stereotypical uh, symptom complex. Um, there's a uh, the, the uh, mental moans, bone groans, and and uh, abdominal stones, and there's a little there are mnemonics that all kinds of people remember. But basically, you just need to know that that hypercalcemia itself will cause volume depletion because they have. Uh, an osmotic diuresis from the calcium. Uh, they get bone pain because the bones are being reabsorbed. Um, they elevated levels of calcium will cause people to become increasing lethargic and confused. Um, they will complain of constipation. Um, and then more importantly, as the levels of calcium rise, they present with an arrhythmia. On a 12 lead ECG, you'll see some pretty classic findings of elevated calcium, specifically a prolonged PR interval. Um, the QRS complex will widen and then also the QT interval will shorten out. Um, and this is due to the direct effects of the elevated calcium levels uh, on the action potential at the myocytes. So the treatment for hypercalcemia is pretty straightforward. First and foremost, remember, they're dry. You need to give them fluids. They're very volume depleted the vast majority of the times, and a lot of their symptoms will actually improve just simply by giving them fluids. Also, by giving them more fluids, you also dilute down the, the uh, calcium levels and you can start bringing it down um, just on that basis alone. Now, 
you may have been told that loop diuretics can help by inhibiting calcium reabsorption, but you really should only do that in the case where you actually know that the patient's volume overloaded. And so you should avoid loop diuretics even in, uh, in the, for the most, most part um, because most of these patients are dry first and foremost. When calcium levels are starting to cause life-threatening arrhythmias, you should actually then move quickly to uh, consider other ways of clearing the, the uh, calcium, particularly using uh, intermittent dialysis. But then while you've got initial management of the hypercalcemia uh, ongoing, you should start looking for both the cause of the hypercalcemia, because as I've said, most of these patients may not present with, uh, with a known malignancy, and hypercalcemia is actually the only reason why they, uh, they came into the hospital. So you need to start a search to identify where the, tumor, uh, where the tumor is and why they're hypercalcemic to begin with, and then initiate some initial treatments. If, the, if this particular um, malignancy is known to be a lymphoma or a myeloma, then steroids may actually be very helpful up front in order to get their calcium levels down, both by, um, uh, by, mostly by absor uh, affecting the reabsorption of calcium, but also by, um, by also melting down the tumor as well. Then the first line therapy for a management of uh, definitive management of the calcium level is to give a bisphosphonate, um, and this uh, bisphosphonates, as you know, uh, bind to the uh, hypot um, hydroxyapatate and block bone uh, dissolving and osteoclast reabsorption. So it helps. It doesn't help rebuild bone, but it certainly prevents it from being uh, further broken down under the influence of PTH and PTH-related peptide. Very rarely you can use calcitonin as well, but this is becoming much less, um, uh, much less popular as a treatment option, um, primarily because of the uh, expense and the relatively low, low effectiveness um, in the long term. Bisphosphonates, once you start them, can actually very, will not only rapidly bring down the sodium levels within a couple of days, but then also have a much more prolonged effect, and so you get more bang for your buck over the long term while you're either treating their other problems or trying to identify the source of their malignancies. All right, well, that's everything. Thanks for watching. And as always, if you have any questions, don't uh, be afraid to leave comments in the section below or contact me directly.